So thanks for the invitation, Avi, and I'm really enjoying this workshop, learning a lot of things. And what I'm going to be talking about today is this kind of convexity which uh, showed up uh, in some of the problems studied by several of the people here, and in fact brought my attention to this uh, topic of geodesic convexity. Now in case you're wondering what this curve is, it's not my signature. It's a, if you look closely enough, this is a non-convex function. It feels convex, but around this point here, you can see that there is a slight concavity to this curve. And if you don't believe it, here is a straight line. It looks like it's crisscrossing this line several times, and that's something you don't expect from a convex function. So if you draw a a, a line which is tangent at a point, then it should be completely below the function. And however, this viewpoint that this function is not convex uh, can be changed if we redefine what it means to be a straight line. And in this case, if we redefine the straight line to be a curve in a very specific manner, this problem that this curve intersects with this function disappears, and that's what we are going to try to understand today. This is geodesic convexity. So geodesics are objects or curves which are equivalent of straight lines in Euclidean space, and most of the talk would be de devoted to explaining these objects and understanding how to do calculus with them, which turns out to be not as straightforward as in the Euclidean case. And if you want to read more about in more detail, uh, there are some notes that are available on this website. <clears throat> so let me first quickly review in one slide convexity and convex optimization. So I guess we all know what is a convex set and what is not a convex set. You take two points, join them by a straight line in this Euclidean space, and if the line lies entirely inside the set for every pair of points, then this is a convex set, and if the line goes outside, then this is not convex. This is how we define a set being convex or not. A convex function, there are various ways to define it, and one way is to do the following. You have this curve, you draw a line, uh, you take two points, and then you look at the value of the function at the endpoints. And if the average of these values is at least the value of the function at the average point, and this happens for all pairs of points which, uh, which are connected by the straight line, then we say that the function is convex. This is also called the zeroth order definition of a convex function. If there is more smooth differential structure in the Euclidean space, then we can also write down or express convexity with respect to gradients and hessians. I guess everybody here knows this and just uh, recalling. Um, and so what is nice about uh, convex functions is the following property, that a local minimum is also a global minimum. And this is, there are a variety of ways to prove it. Any of these descriptions of the convex function allows you to prove. And the problem that we would like to try to understand is given a function which has this property where the local minimum is the global minimum, how can we compute optimal solutions to this convex problem? So X star, let's say, is some unique, uh, some solution to this, some optimal solution, some minimum solution to this uh, <coughs> function. And what we would like in convex optimization is to find a point X hat, let's say, which is not too far off from the value at the optimal point. And this error is measured by this parameter, which is given as an input, epsilon. And so what are the key methods? So there are roughly three types of methods that exist. And so these are not single algorithms. These are collection of algorithms, meta-algorithms. And there are books written on this stuff. 
so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but let me just tell you that roughly gradient descent type methods, uh, uh, you can view them in continuous time by saying that if you're at a point, you compute the gradient and move in the negative direction of the gradient instantaneously, or in discrete time, you have maybe also a step size, and then you take a step in the direction of the negative gradient. Newton type methods uh, arise by uh, essentially thinking of the function as a quadratic function, so you approximate the function by a quadratic function, and then derive essentially a gradient step. And here, you, your direction is the gradient, which is scaled by some positive definite matrix. So since the function is convex, the Hessian is positive definite, and this you can also view um, and relate to the previous talk that you just saw. So these are the kind of dynamics which also arise as Newton. The difference from the previous talk versus here is that the, the function is the same. Okay, so there there was a different potential function. Okay, and, and cutting plane methods. So these are, in my view, the ultimate methods, at least from a point of view of P versus not in P. And there is a, a uh, these are not the fastest methods, but these are the most powerful methods. And I will talk about this uh, towards the end of my talk. And examples of this method are the ellipsoid method, which many of you here probably already know about. So what about running time? So now this is where the whole Pandora's box opens up. Um, convex optimization in general is not in P. This statement doesn't even make sense because we have to specify what the input is and how the input is specified. And even then, the, uh, the running time depends on a variety of parameters which involve the function, the error, the distance to the starting point, and the time to compute the gradient, the time to compute the Hessian, and so on. So, <coughs> so there are like you know, thousands of methods with, with, with all kinds of dependencies, and this is a very, very rich literature. And <coughs> in the last uh, couple of decades, um, I mean, I think it's safe to say that convex optimization and methods developed in that context are really driving algorithm design in machine learning as well as uh, the, the use of continuous methods to solve discrete problems, which is a trend in theoretical computer science, and as a consequence, a lot of progress has happened. So this is, uh, this is, all, uh, this is all great, except in the last few years, there are also some very curious problems that have emerged, which which, uh, which are optimization problems uh, for which we know how to solve them through methods, which you, some of you, which you have heard about here, but we do not understand, or we, are not, we were not able to place them entirely in the framework of convex optimization. So let me give you two examples, and these are the two examples that we will talk about throughout the talk. The first is the following that you're given a polynomial which has positive coefficients and just assume it's a multilinear polynomial. Okay, so, so everybody knows what a multilinear polynomial is, positive or non-negative coefficients. <coughs> and the way you are given access to this polynomial is that you can write down an input and it'll tell you what the value of the polynomial is. And you're also given a point uh, which has positive entries, and in general it has more constraints. I'm not going to talk about them right now. Uh, and the goal of this problem one is to solve the following optimization problem. It looks strange, but by now I guess to the audience here it should not. So this is the log of the polynomial minus summation of theta i times log of xi. And you want to optimize this over the positive orthend. So, we, so, so this is an infinite set. Uh, it goes all the way from, you know, from zero to infinity in all directions, in the positive directions. And, and the, the interest in this problem emerges due to applications of this to discrete counting problems. Um, 
I mean, going back uh, to works of Leonard Gurwitz and, and more recently, some of my work with my uh, student, Damien Strashak, and collaborator, Mohit Singh. So these problems are not just uh, uh, cute optimization problems, they're also related to counting. Uh, but uh, it turns out that these, uh, these, these functions are not convex in general. And however, sometimes they are concave, and that's, that's a beautiful theory, uh, you know, hyperbolic polynomials, real stable, but that's not, you know, we still cannot uh, minimize concave functions, okay? So our goal is to minimize, and typically convex optimization works when you want to minimize a convex function. So this is not a convex optimization problem. However, methods existed even before for, for us to be able to solve these problems. Now here is another problem, uh, which is the following. So you're given M matrices, B1 to Bm. Each matrix, think of it as a rectangular matrix, a fat matrix, which has L rows and N columns, and they correspond to <coughs> some linear space. And again, you're given a point theta, and your goal is to solve the following optimization problem, which involves log of the determinant of matrices and in some funny looking way. But the, the point is here that instead of optimizing over the positive orthant, here we are optimizing over the set of positive definite matrices. Okay? Um, this problem uh, turns out to be very intimately related to this workshop. Um, it has, uh, you can prove that the value of this, if you can compute, will give you the brass camp leap constant, which has been intensely studied by a lot of people, including many people here in the audience. <clears throat> um, again, it's not a convex optimization problem. It's not so immediately obvious how this relates to this, but you can show that the rank one case of this, where, where, where L is equal to one, can be written down in this manner of P1. So if P1 is already non-convex, then this is also non-convex. <clears throat> and there are algorithms, and we saw in Raphael's talk, which can solve this problem. However, we do not know polynomial time algorithms um, to be able to solve these problems. Okay, so that's still an open problem and that remains an open problem. And the punchline of this talk is, and the motivation for studying everything, is that both these problems turn out to be uh, geodesically convex, whatever that means. And the hope is that by understanding geodesic convexity and developing methods to solve geodesically convex optimization problems, we will be able to solve this problem. That's my hope, and I guess many people here uh, as well. And, and in, the next, in, the, in, the, in the next talk, you will see um, uh, uh, some progress towards this, some special cases of this called operator scaling have been uh, uh, succumbed to methods from geodesic convex optimization. Okay, so, <coughs> so convexity versus geodesic convexity. What are, what are the things, when we talk about convexity, what are the things that we assume? So there is some ambient space, which we, without even blinking our eyes, assume it's a Euclidean space. Uh, something that we probably never explicitly say, but there is a sense in which we do differentiation in this Euclidean space, or, which is called calculus, um, which is so intimately tied to our notion of Euclidean space that we don't even think about it. And then come objects like straight lines. So once you have a notion of differentiation, you can say what is a straight line. And once you have a notion of a straight line, you can say what is a convex set. Once you have a notion of a convex set, you can define convex functions. 
Once you have convex functions and convex sets, you can talk about convex optimization and this property that local uh, minima equal to global minima is essentially a way in which the differential structure interacts with the function. And that's really what it is an outcome of. And then as we all know that there is this whole body of works on algorithms for convex optimization. So it's a great area, very successful, very practical. Um, what about geodesic convexity? So geodesic convexity is not a new thing. It has been around for a very long time. Um, so if this is, uh, there are books written with titles uh, on geodesic convexity. <coughs> uh, so the, the central uh, uh, difference when you go from uh, convexity to geodesic convexity is that you move from this notion of a Euclidean space to a manifold, which is a more abstract topological object. And once you are in this object, differentiation is no longer given or clear. There could be many ways in which you could define a notion of how to differentiate a function or how to differentiate a vector field. And this requires imposing a structure on this topological object, which is called an affine connection. Once you do that, uh, you can start talking about straight lines with respect to this differential structure, and those are the objects which are called geodesics. And then uh, we can talk about geodesic convexity uh, in a similar manner as how we did in convexity. Uh, it turns out that in this view, local optimum is equal to global optimum, so that's, that's nice. So you can think of algorithms which move locally and hope to converge uh, to, the, to the optimum. But what seems to be completely uh, 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 a disparate situation here is that there are not many general purpose algorithms known for geodesic uh, convex optimization. Okay, so I hope this gives you an idea of what we are going to do in the talk. So the talk has uh, three parts, uh, not equal. Uh, uh, most of the talk I'll focus upon uh, introducing these objects, uh, manifolds, geodesics, geodesic convexity. Uh, in the second part of the talk, I'm going to show you simple proofs uh, of geodesic convexity of these two functions, or these two problems that I defined earlier. <coughs> and in the third part of the talk, I will show you an algorithm, which is an ellipsoid-based algorithm to solve this, uh, the first problem, which was in this positive orthant. And then I will conclude with some open problems and challenges. Any questions so far? Okay, so, <coughs> so this might be boring for the, the mathematicians in the, in the audience, uh, but nevertheless, I think it's useful to, to, to go over it. Um, so when we talk about manifolds, we think of objects such as a sphere, uh, and toruses, these are some of the simplest non-Euclidean spaces. However, they do have this property that even though they're non-Euclidean, at each point, locally, there is, you, you know, you, you, can, you, you can see a, a, a large Euclidean space around you. So, I mean, Earth was believed to be flat for many years, and that's the reason, I guess, because, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> and, <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, an, important, uh, quant uh, an important object associated to each point in a manifold is what is called this local Euclidean space or what is called the tangent space and it's denoted by, uh, so if we denote the manifold by M and if we are at a point P, then T sub P of M is the notation for this linear space which consists of all directions you can move at that point on the manifold, okay? <clears throat> so imagine 
this torus where there are people at different points on this torus, they have their own uh, uh, tangent spaces and they're, they, that's, their, that's their world view, right? that's their map or chart. And of course then when people are close enough, these charts or these maps or these tangent spaces intersect, they have overlap. And which means that they have to agree on, on, uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the points at which they intersect. And this agreement, I mean, I, can, I don't want to go into a lot of formalities, but this agreement, if it's smooth with respect to uh, these maps which connect these charts, such a manifold is called a smooth manifold. Okay, that's, that's all. If, if, you, if you really want to think, I mean, if you don't want to think abstractly a manifold, think of it as a, as a bagel or a donut or a ball, and this is good enough. Okay, so once we have manifolds, uh, 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 well, you can have functions on manifolds. That's something easy to understand. Uh, you just associate a real number to every point in the manifold. That's a function. Uh, something a little bit more uh, interesting is a vector field over a manifold. And here you see examples of uh, two different vector fields on the torus. So a vector field is just tells you at each point gives you a direction where you should proceed next. And this is a unique direction at every point. Okay. And this is, uh, these are some, um, these are some pictures which give you a sense of what these objects are. Uh, we can also talk about curves. If you start following a vector field, then this gives rise to curves. You set up a, a vector field and you start following it, it gives rise to curves. So this, is, this gives rise to a notion of a curve. Great, so what's missing? What's missing uh, so far is differentiation. So in a Euclidean space, we can talk about differentiation <coughs> and something which is called uh, uh, directional derivatives, which are, if you are at a point, uh, if, if you're given a function, so let's not look at the n-dimensional case, let's look at a single function which is specified in the Euclidean space, and you want to know how the function changes with respect to a particular direction. So you are at this point, you move a little bit in that direction, look at the value of the function at this point, you take the difference, and you, 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 you can get you can, get, uh, you can get this directional derivative. And this notion generalizes not only to just a single function, but to a collection of functions. And the reason why all this is so trivial is because everybody has the same coordinate system. It's a flat space. So you, know, you are here or there, the coordinate system we have all agreed on universally. Whereas this is the big problem on a manifold that people do not agree on, on a coordinate system. And that's really why the manifold is an interesting object. So we have to impose a structure <coughs> on this. And such a structure, as I mentioned earlier, is called an affine connection. And this is the replacement of a directional derivative in this, in this sense. So you're given a vector field. So, uh, so this is the space of all vector fields. So, so, so this operator, nabla, acts on two vector fields and outputs another vector field. Uh, so this is exactly an analog of this, so that if you differentiate each of the coordinates, you get one number. So think of f1 to fn as one vector field uh, coming from one vector field, x coming from another vector field, and the output is also a vector. So the vector which of, of functions, a vector in which you want to differentiate, and the vector, which is the output collection of all the derivatives. So any such object, we, can, we should require some nice properties, otherwise it doesn't make sense. At least it should be consistent uh, in the case of Euclidean <coughs> geometry. And there are some uh, natural properties which are inspired by looking at what the directional derivative should satisfy. Um, and these are, uh, uh, the first two of them are linearity, which, so there are two, uh, so there are two vector fields, they're not the same. One is the thing that you are differentiating and one is the thing which, with respect to which you are differentiating. 
So we would require linearity with respect to the vector field which we are differentiating as well as the vector field which we are differentiating. Okay, so this is, this is something you would want from uh, a differential structure. Also, I guess we know this chain rule of differentiation and which is called Leibniz rule. And we would also like that the Leibniz rule holds uh, in this setting. So it's not quite important to follow exactly what is written there, but to understand that we have a choice in, uh, in, in, in picking an affine connection as long as they satisfy some axiomatic properties which are inspired from our understanding of differentiation on a Euclidean space. Okay, so differentiation uh, still is nice. I can differentiate so I can know how quantities are changing. It doesn't tell me how to measure things. If I want to go from this point to this point, how far or how much energy will I be spending? If I need to know this, I need to define <coughs> some kind of a metric or a, a, a metric on this manifold which, which gives me a way to measure distances. And such an object, again, has to be local. It can, it can only tell you distances in the chart that you are holding. Everything is changing. So with respect to me, if I am standing at a point in a manifold, then I, if you give me two vectors, uh, I should be able to calculate their inner product. And if I can calculate the inner product, I can also calculate the length of a vector in the tangent space, and so on. So I'm going to talk about Riemannian metric tensors, although much of this stuff generalizes beyond Riemannian. Uh, <clears throat> and a metric tensor is an operator which takes two vectors. At each point in, uh, on the manifold, it takes two vectors from the tangent space in this, in this, uh, of this uh, point. And it has, again, some uh, nice properties that you expect from your standard Euclidean inner product, which is symmetry, bilinearity. And if, in addition, you impose that this metric has what is called this positive definiteness, then it is called a Riemannian metric tensor. Okay. So these are two different things. Doing differentiation on a manifold is something that allows you to measure how things are changing, whereas setting up a metric structure allows you to measure quantities and give some definite meaning to things like energy and, and, and lengths and, and angles and so on. <coughs> However, these two things can also be related to each other. Okay. And in particular, you can impose a couple of conditions which relate a metric tensor to an affine connection. So we can set up some equations and say how these should interact with each other. So far, these equations and these equations don't interact with each other. And now I'm going to write down two equations which, which tell you some rules on how these two quantities should interact. And these are, again, uh, I'm not going to explain especially the torsion-free part, but the compatibility part is kind of intuitive. Uh, it's, it's kind of like the chain rule. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're taking the derivative of this. I mean, I'm misusing the notation here, but you're taking the derivative of this inner product, and you expect it to split as you would expect uh, when you apply the chain rule in, in the standard Euclidean case. What, what happens when you say that, okay, so if you have a metric which is also compatible with this connection, then the choice of an affine connection becomes unique. And this is called the first fundamental theorem of Riemannian geometry, uh, and the, the connection, the unique connection, is called the levi civita connection. Okay, so, so, and this is the setting that we are going to work on. Okay, and, and let me just say again that this is not necessarily true just for Riemannian metrics. 
It's also true, for example, for objects called pseudo-Riemannian metrics, <coughs> which are important for relativity, and so on. So there's nothing really special about Riemannian uh, right now. But this compatibility conditions uh, essentially imply that you can either view differentiation arising from the metric or view the metric arising from the differential structure. And there's, this is very concrete, okay? So, there, so, so this, uh, this affine connection is actually a tensor, uh, and it's, the entries of this tensor are called the so-called Christoffel symbols, uh, which, which, is a three, uh, which is a n cross n cross n tensor, and it completely describes, just like a matrix completely describes the action of a linear operator with respect to one basis into another basis similarly. So this is not so hard to describe. Uh, and so you can write down explicit equations between Christoffel symbols and the metric which relates them. And you can read more about this stuff in any book on differential geometry and also in my notes if you want to read. Uh, yeah. Uh, any questions so far? So far, this is the talk with the least number of questions in the first half hour. Yeah. The direction derivative of a scalar function doesn't really define things. That's right. right. Yeah. Any That's right. Because if I go, I mean, so, so you are holding a scalar quantity. If I want to go from here to there, all is, it's, it's just a scalar. Scalar doesn't depend on my chart. But if you're holding a vector, then I don't know what your vector means, so I have to bring it back to my world, and that already requires our worldviews to be connected. Well, scalars, it's fine. Yeah, that's why there is a symbol here, d sub x of f, which is the <coughs> derivative. Any other questions? So, your definition of functional free is this is the Lie bracket. Yes, but it's supposed to be you just define the Lie bracket. Uh, no, no, this is not the definition of Lie bracket. So this is the, it's yeah, it's equal. Yeah, I, I did not define Lie bracket, so I don't want to go into Lie brackets. Uh, that's not uh, uh, relevant so much. This is just for your knowledge, largely, uh, I think. It's not really going to be super useful in doing the calculations. Okay, so let's look at, uh, let's look at some examples. And here is an example, positive orthant. This is the, 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 the domain that showed up uh, in the first problem. Uh, so here the tangent space is the whole Euclidean space. You are in the positive orthant. You can move anywhere, no problem. And the metric that we consider is the following. So if at, a, if at a point P, which has all coordinates positive, you give me two vectors, U and V, these are any vectors now, positive or negative, because they, have, they live in the tangent space, then the inner product is defined in this following manner. So it's the summation of UI, VI, where UI, VI are the coordinates, divided by PI squared. <clears throat> uh, any idea where this metric comes from? No. No, it's no. It's, no, it's also chi square. Uh, people who were paying attention in the previous talk. And it's a product metric? So it's a Hessian of the log barrier function. No, but this is what they said. They said linearization <laughs> of Kuhlblatt cool problem. So you take quadratic. Okay, I'm sorry, I did not understand what you said. Yeah. Okay, but this is, uh, this is not the entropy function. This is, the, this is what is called an interior point method the log barrier function for this positive orthant. So this is the gradient in some sense of the entropy function. So this, uh, uh, this metric actually arises as a Hessian of the log barrier function and in particular, so it has even more structure and such manifolds or such metrics are called Hessian metrics and such manifolds are called Hessian manifolds. <coughs> uh, what about the levi shivita connection? It's, it's, it's not too difficult to work out. This is like a two, three minute exercise, which I'm going to skip. But at a point P, uh, you can try to understand what, how does 
the, the ith coordinate change with respect to the jth coordinate, and you write down its component in the kth coordinate, right? So that's what, the, 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 the nice thing about this manifold is that it is what is called an embedded manifold. It means that it's some sub-manifold of the Euclidean space. So we can still do stuff like this quite easily. And this is a calculation that I suggest as an exercise to, to try to, know, to learn these definitions uh, that the only non-zero term that you get in this differential structure is the i comma i comma i term and rest is all zero. Okay, and we are doing it at a point P, so this point shows up as an inverse. <clears throat> okay, let's look at its uh, elder sibling, the positive definite uh, manifold, uh, the, 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 the set of positive definite matrices. Here, the tangent space consists of all symmetric n cross n matrices. <coughs> this is also some manifold. And here you have to be a little bit more careful in doing calculations because, because of symmetry, uh, you have to, you know, so the ambient space of this is n times n plus one by two. So you have to pick the right basis and do these calculations slightly more care. Um, but let me tell you what the Riemannian metric is. And the Riemannian metric here looks something similar to what is written here. So if, I, if you give me two symmetric matrices, U and V, and you are at a point P, which is, the posi which is a positive definite matrix, then it's the trace of P inverse U, P inverse V. Okay, so one more question. <laughs> Where does this come from? Any ideas? Sorry? That's great. Uh, this is the Hessian of the, the negative of the log debt function. So Hessian uh, with respect to these directions, okay? So this is also a Hessian manifold. And yeah, so here, as I said, that uh, because of this uh, symmetry, the, the calculations of the levi shivita get a little bit more complicated. And I'm going, I don't think that's an exercise that I can give you in the middle of my talk. So I'll, I'll leave it as a homework problem. Uh, Okay, so we have, uh, we have uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, some idea of what we are talking about, and these are the two objects that are important for us, so. Now let's talk uh, about geodesics. So there are two ways to talk, think about geodesics. It's not, uh, yeah, so, so maybe, I mean, I, I, I used to think that there's one, but then I soon realized I was wrong. There are two ways to talk about geodesics. So one is that these are curves on a manifold which take tangent vectors parallel to the curve, whatever that means, okay? Uh, it's a definition which does not involve any metric, no length, it just requires a way to specify what does parallel mean, and you can imagine that that has to do with the differential structure. So this definition can be written in terms of the differential structure. Um, so for example, this is Euclidean space, there are two points P and Q, and the vector that you want to transport from P to Q is this vector pointing in this direction, okay? So this is the, <coughs> and this vector, which is, if you think of this as a curve, then this vector is just Q minus P. It's moving from P and taking you to Q. It's not changing in the Euclidean space. So in the Euclidean space, the equations for a geodesic are just that the time derivative of the time derivative of the curve is zero. This is not something uh, you know that a line has a second derivative zero. It's ax plus b uh, or something like that. So if you take the second derivative, at plus b, second derivative is zero. But that's one way. So you see, it's, it's, it's to do with differentiation. That's the point. Uh, there is a more uh, 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 metric-based view to define things, which is in terms of a shortest curve between points. But for that, first I need a notion of length. So how does the length of this compare with others? So these are all possible curves that can take you from P to Q. If I can only measure the length 
or, uh, of the curve, then I can define what it means to be a shortest curve. And one way to define <coughs> length, or rather square length, is you, you take all the vectors, all the tangent vectors along the curve, you look at their norm squared, and integrate this with uh, over, over the entire, entire curve, starting at p and ending at q. And then if you set up this optimization problem, which says that now find the curve which minimizes this energy functional, you get a geodesic, okay? This is what you saw in the previous talk uh, about this, this uh, one definition involving the squared uh, uh, L2 norm and something to do with the kullback leibler divergence uh, between two measures. That's exactly what is going on uh, uh, in that definition. Okay, so this is, uh, okay, so for a straight line again, you can do this calculation and you will get back to the same equation. Because to optimize this, you will have to use maybe uh, to calculus of variations, so you introduce some perturbation in the curve and, and study the first order conditions, and that, that's really what gives you back this. Okay, so this is all, uh, looks all trivial. Uh, these two views give, you, give rise to the same equation, so you might be wondering why am I saying all this stuff? Well, in the world of manifolds, things become a little more interesting, and it's not clear what a parallel transport means, and in fact, uh, uh, when you transport a vector parallelly, it corresponds to given a way to differentiate vector fields on a manifold, it corresponds to exactly this equation, that the, the derivative with respect to the affine connection of the gradient of the, of the curve with respect to the gradient is zero. So this is the equation of a geodesic in this view. In the other view, <coughs> uh, we can do the same thing. We can set up uh, an energy and, and look for the energy minimizing curve. Um, and here it turns out that the differential equation is the following. It looks a little bit uh, much looks more complicated than this, at least in terms of number of math or latex symbols being used, but it turns out that it is the same, okay? And this is not an entirely trivial correspondence. It uses the connection, the levi shivita connection to, to, to do that. But the nice thing is that this generalizes heavily, and you can talk about uh, all kinds of uh, uh, very abstract objects like probability distributions, which you saw in the previous talk. <coughs> and just a small comment, I mean, the length of the geodesics are exactly this kullback leibler divergence which you, sh which you saw. So there, in some cases, you can also do explicit calculations. Um, But, either the, but the, the affine structure is not a local object. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a global object. It's a differential structure. It's not defined. I mean, it's. Just, well, the, I don't, uh, the, the equation on the left would be true if you went from B to Q, also the other way around is true. That's right. So you, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's, a, uh, correct, uh, that's a very correct uh, observation. And in particular, <laughs> these two notions of geodesics are, I was lying a little bit, that they're not <laughs> exactly identical. Because here, you can also go around the sphere on the other side, right? Um, so things like this can also happen. But other than that, they are equivalent. So morally, they are equivalent. <coughs> okay. So it turns out that sometimes this is more useful to do geodesic calculations. Sometimes it turns out that this is more useful to do geodesic calculations. And <coughs> Uh, let, let me show you an example. <coughs> so, uh, for the positive orthant, uh, with, this, uh, with this affine connection, uh, which is derived from the metric, uh, the geodesic equation, um, I mean, if you just 
express this gamma dot vector in some basis and gamma i dot is the co ith coordinate of this curve, then you get an equation like this. Okay, so this is the differential equation. So this is, this is for each i, it behaves independently and uh, this is just a simple ODE and you can solve it. Uh, you can bring one gamma i dot at the bottom here so it has this form that the time derivative of the log of gamma i dot is equal to time derivative of log gamma i, right? Because the, the derivative of this is gamma i dot divided by gamma i. The derivative of this is gamma i dot dot divided by gamma i dot. So it's the same, just a different way to write it. And the solution to this is a, uh, very simple. Uh, this is <coughs> this is just the this is just the um, exponential. Okay. So nothing uh, really that you didn't know before, except maybe you never derived it in this manner. But I'm sure everybody here has done this calculation. <coughs> So this is the, um, and so what happens on the positive definite? <coughs> so here, <coughs> uh, it turns out that this equation uh, is a bit more easier to work with. And um, you can simplify this. Uh, it's not, uh, it's, it doesn't take a lot of work. And the equation turns out to be the following. So now gamma is a matrix, remember. Okay, it's not, not a scalar. And, and these equations now are no longer separable. It's not like for each coordinate you can write down a separate ODE. And so the equation is gamma dot times gamma inverse is equal to some constant matrix which doesn't have to be symmetric. <coughs> and this you can solve explicitly again by simple uh, techniques and you get that the curve of matrices which connects uh, or, or geodesics are of this type. These are matrix exponentials times some matrix T. It's not, it's not difficult. I mean, you, you can look up uh, that's the solution in my notes or, or you can try to do it yourself. And in particular, this allows you to then, by setting boundary conditions, derive the geodesic between two points, two, two positive matrices. So P and Q are positive matrices. And the answer turns out to be that this is the geodesic that joins P and Q with respect to the log dead, the Hessian of the log dead metric that we talked about. So in this expression, T is between zero and one. T is between zero and one, yes. Yeah, so we can just check one thing, that if I plug in t equal to zero, this becomes p, and if I plug t equal to one, then this p half cancels with this, and this cancels with this, and you're left with q. Yeah. Yeah. Is the left hand sum is isomorphic to the end? Yeah, it's just, it's, Yeah, it's a, it's a product, yeah. Yeah. What is the first example is actually, yeah, he illustrated the general technique. Yeah. Essentially, you plug in the exponents and you take distance between, uh, between logarithms. So yeah. Uh, yeah, and. Straight line and logarithms. Right. And in fact, you can just do a simple exercise now uh, calculate lengths of geodesics between P and Q. And let's say P and Q are not just positive, but they're probability distributions you get exactly the kullback leibler divergence, and you can also see why this is asymmetric, because, I mean, in a, in a manifold, going from one point to another point, if it's, you know, uh, it's not the same the other direction, so, yeah, okay. So you get the point, and, and uh, many of these formulas are, are used in establishing geodesic convexity, and that was the point of doing these calculations. Okay, so, so we have some idea of what geodesics are. We know that in some cases we can do exact calculations, uh, which is nice. And uh, now one can talk about geodesic convexity. And here there's no big surprise. So I, I showed you the zeroth order characterization, the first order characterization, the second order characterization. These just go line by line. 
uh, you replace the straight line connecting two points by the geodesic that connects them. Okay? And uh, for instance, let's look at the second order characterization. It says that the function is geodesically convex if you take a geodesic gamma and you take any geodesic gamma, uh, then the, the derivative, which is the usual derivative, squared. So the second derivative of this function along this curve remains non-negative. Okay? So this is, uh, this is uh, when we just redefine straight lines or metrics, this is what comes out, and it's <coughs> quite believable, I guess. <clears throat> and you can also show this property quite easily that if f is geodesically convex, then every local minima is also a global minima. So, in fact, this was the property of the, the when I first saw this in, in this GGOW 16 paper, and then they make a remark that we have this function, it's not geodesic, it's not convex, but it has the same value at all the minimas. And so, if we just find any minima, we are fine, right? And uh, it's, uh, if it had two different uh, minimas, which are different value, then that function cannot be geodesically convex. You cannot put a metric on that. That's one way to, yeah. You need some assumptions. On the connectivity, that's right. Sorry? You need some that's right. That's, yes, yes. I need an assumption that these two points are connected by a geodesic. Yes, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to the, the, the thing in, the, in, the, in my title slide, so the function was uh, log x squared. And <coughs> this is the linear approximation, the green line, and the blue line is the geodesic. Uh, with respect to this uh, metric in the, uh, in the positive orthogonal that I just described. Okay, so now you can see that this geodesic uh, always lies below. So this is an example of a function which, no matter what you do, you cannot prove that this is geodesically convex because there are, there is this point and, uh, well, there is this point and this point, uh, yeah, which are, well, I should have drawn a little bit more of it than it was clear, so, or inverted this figure. Okay. Okay, great. So we have, uh, um, any questions about uh, geodesic convexity before uh, uh, I go on to argue about the geodesic convexity of these examples? Okay. Yes, yeah, so in principle, there are a zillion ways to prove that this problem is uh, easy, but I'm choosing this path, because this path also illuminates how to proceed in other examples where it's not so obvious. So this was a problem we talked about. You are given a multilinear polynomial. Uh, so, 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 so think of F as the uh, family of all monomials on which the polynomial is uh, uh, supported. Uh, C sub tau is the coefficient. It's a non-negative number. <coughs> and X tau is just this multinomial. Okay? And we want to prove that this function is geodesically convex. Log of such a polynomial is geodesically convex. Okay? With respect to the, the, the metric that we already talked about on this positive orthogonal. So we know what a geodesic looks like. We just did this calculation. Um, you can pick some any positive vectors uh, uh, beta, and you can pick any real vector alpha, and a geodesic looks like this. <coughs> and the second order convexity condition says that p log p is geodesically convex if I take the second time derivative of this across this curve, it's non-negative. Okay? So let's just do that. So this is the derivative of the log of some function. So this looks like time derivative of p divided by p. 
right? I guess we all know this. I mean, this is just a kind of a log partition function, and so this is an expectation, essentially, right? So we, we know this. Uh, and if we now take the second derivative of this, we will get p double dot by p minus p dot by p squared. This is a variance term. Okay, if you think of this as an expectation, which, what, which is what it is, p dot by p is an expectation, and this is, this is just a variance of the distribution induced by the coefficients of the polynomial, <coughs> something that was again mentioned in the previous talk. And, and so you can do all this calculation or just view it like this and see that this is a variance, so it has to be non-negative. And I think this was also mentioned to some extent or to even explicitly in Michael's talk, right? <clears throat> um, yeah, so that's it. Done with the easy example. Okay, yeah. Maybe it can be done basically without calculation, just by proving a little lemma, saying if you have two logarithmic keys, here that's where well, you have two log convex function, take yeah. the sum and again log convex. That's right. Yeah, no, that's right. And then, so it's enough. <coughs> that's right. Great. That's a that's a that's an even simpler way to present it. Yes. So by, by the way, uh, thanks for mentioning this observation because I will need this in my next slide. Yeah. Proof of two log is equivalent to proving the sum of two positive semi-definite matrices. Which is actually very basic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so let's look at the, uh, the, 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 the problem related to brasskamp leap. And here is the formulation that I was talking about. And in all these things, it depends what the formulation is. You know, you can write down multiple formulations for, for the same problem. Not everything will turn out to be convex or geodesically convex. So this is one particular one we came up with. Uh, and now I'll show you a proof that this is geodesically convex. <coughs> with respect to um, uh, with respect to the the metric I introduced on the positive definite cone. <coughs> so uh, let's now let's go back and look at what the uh, what the metric is. It's uh, oh, sorry, what the geodesic is. It's it's uh, it's this formula. And a simple fact is that this function, log det of x, is a linear function with respect to these geodesics. Okay? Let's just see why. Well, if I take a geodesic like this uh, and I take the log det of that, then I get by just the definitions of log, 1 minus t times the log det of p plus t times the log that of q, which is exactly what it means to be linear. So it's both geodesically convex and geodesically concave. So the notion of geodesic concavity is just a negative of geodesic convexity. <coughs> and here's the result, which is known, that if you have a strictly positive linear operator, uh, then the log debt function applied to the positive operator in this sense uh, remains geodesically convex. It's not difficult to prove. It's, uh, it's <clears throat> um, um, it kind of follows from uh, the kind of stuff we have talked about. You do require some monotonicity of some, something. So it's a, it's, it's, it was a little bit divergent, so I didn't want to present the proof of this. It's a well-known fact. Uh, geodesically convex again with respect to the same metric. I would also like maybe Peter, uh, you know, one line proof of this would be great. Uh, it's, it's, it, it might have a one line proof, I don't know. Okay, so now by, by this observation that uh, uh, Peter uh, mentioned that sums or if you have two geodesically convex functions, then if I take their sums, positive sums, <coughs> they remain geodesically convex. If I look at this function, it has many terms. One is this minus log that x term, which we have handled because it is linear. So we can get rid of this. There are many terms here still, and they combine. 
but it is enough to prove that each of these expressions is, is uh, geodesically convex. Because p's are all, or what are these, uh, thetas are all positive, and so we are only taking positive combinations. <coughs> so the positivity is important here. And you can show that. So if you want to use Ando and Kubo's theorem, uh, all you need to show is that this mapping defined as bj xpj transpose is a, you know, is a positive linear map. <clears throat> and this is not always true. Uh, but if you have some conditions on this datum, this brass camp leap datum, uh, which essentially correspond to it being non-degenerate, then we can show that it is true. And the proof is here. It's easy enough uh, that I put this on the slide. So suppose there is, uh, so, so suppose Ti of x is not strictly positive linear, then it implies that there must exist some positive definite matrix where uh, if I look at and some vector v so that this quadratic form is negative, or this, this quantity is uh, non-positive. <coughs> and this essentially implies that v should be in the, uh, uh, you know, v should be, bi transpose v should be zero. That's the only way this can happen. And the reason is because x is positive, right? So x is positive. The only way you can have a negative inner uh, quadratic form arising from a positive matrix is when the vector itself is zero. And that in particular means that the dimension of how the subspace induced by this matrix bi is at least one less than the number of rows. And that gives us a contradiction if, since we had already assumed that these two non-degeneracy conditions hold for the brass camp leap datum, uh, we get a contradiction because the dimension of Rn is n, but by this, this equality here, we get that this is equal to the weighted sum of the dimensions of the action of Bj on Rn. Um, well, each of them, none of them can be more than L, and one of them is less than L, right? So this is at most L times <coughs> summation theta j, which is equal to n by our assumption here again. So this is a contradiction. And that's the proof. <clears throat> okay. So, in particular, uh, from this, uh, or even before this, it, you know, Avi and uh, his co-authors already knew that uh, uh, this uh, this brass camp leaf has a geodesically convex formulation by reduction to operator scaling. And the issue with that reduction was that it requires an exponential size in the input complexity of the brass camp leap datum. This formulation in particular is efficient. And the hope is that it will lead to a polynomial time algorithm. And so far, we don't have any. Uh, let's, let's look at how do we solve any version of this problem, which includes the rank one, which is already non-trivial. Yeah. That's right. Yes. Nothing to do with the bit complexities of B1 to Bm, but the bit complexities in particular, if you assume that all the entries of theta are rational numbers with some common denominator, then this denominator needs to be polynomial in the dimension for their reduction to be polynomial. So, so there is this issue. Okay, so I have a uh, uh, few more minutes and I want to say a couple of slides about uh, an algorithm. So, and how do we solve this <coughs> rank one problem? Okay, so this is the function uh, that we want to optimize. And let's denote this function inside the infimum as f. 
Um, here I've already done the transformation. And after doing this transformation, actually I know that the, it's not only geodesically convex, it's actually convex in, this, in these new variables y. So this is a convex optimization formulation of the problem. And let's denote by opt the optimal value of this program, of this convex program. So we are doing convex programming now. Geodesic convexity is done, okay? We, I, I have nothing further to say, at least till that last slide. So this is just, uh, this is the, if you go back to my first slide, I mentioned about cutting plane methods. This is now going to be one of the cutting plane methods which we are going to use. <coughs> so as, as is usual in solving um, optimization problems, one of the first steps is to reduce uh, finding the optimum by a binary search to checking the following kind of a feasibility problem. That you give me a number A and ask me if the optimum is at most A or at least A. Okay, so if you can solve this problem, I uh, also have to take into account the bit complexity of A now. Uh, so it depends on how large the function can get. But yeah, this is the problem that we're going to solve. And, <coughs> you know, if you're searching for a solution, if somebody tells me that there's a lion in Sahara, go find it, then first I need to know how big the Sahara is, right? So, uh, so I need some bound on how far the optimal solution lies uh, from the origin. Without this, I cannot do any optimization in this sense. And I also need some sense of what is the range of the function value from minus m to m. So these are two numbers, r and m, which are not part of the input, but they depend on the input. And in particular, their being reasonably small will be important for these algorithms to be polynomial time, okay? That's really important to note. It's not just a matter of detail. It's, it's, it's something real uh, which, which we have to bound. And so, okay, so how do these, suppose you give me such a number uh, or I can guess the number R based on the structure of the problem. <coughs> then what does the algorithm do? It's, uh, it's the following. It starts with a large ball or an ellipsoid that contains, which is guaranteed to contain the optimal point. And since you have already, uh, since somehow we have already know this number R, we know what ellipsoid to construct. And it's an iterative algorithm. And at the kth step, uh, let's denote E sub K to be the ellipsoid centered at YK. And what it does is it asks the following question uh, to this function. Is the value of the function at this point, yk, at most the given number a? Okay, so yk is being proposed as a possible certificate for the feasibility problem. And either if the answer is yes, then we are done. We can say yes. Uh, we can very confidently stop the algorithm and return yes. If the answer is no, then we have to do something. And what we do in these methods is we then ask for another question to this function and say, okay, now can you tell me what the gradient of the function is at this point? Because I will use this gradient information to cut the ellipsoid because I know that the line is not on this side of the Sahara, so I should localize myself to this. But there comes the, the beautiful idea is that if, I, if you keep asking me these questions, okay, here's a cut, here's a cut, here's a cut, the object starts becoming ugly and ugly, and you lose mathematical control over this object. So the beautiful idea is that instead of looking at uh, the, this set, which is the intersection of this half space with the ellipsoid, you find an ellipsoid which has minimum volume and contains this set. So the simplicity of this object is maintained. And yet, one can prove that the volume of the ellipsoid drops. And uh, <coughs> that's it, that's the ellipsoid algorithm. And you keep doing this, and at some point, you have to stop. Well, you knew that the line is in the Sahara, right? You know what the size of the line is. 
So if, if you are in a very, very small neighborhood, even though you may not be able to see the line, but you know for sure that the line is very close to me. And so that is really the rationale for stopping. And so you can stop. And in particular, for this problem, uh, the radius of the ellipsoid, which you can define as the largest length, if it becomes smaller than epsilon r over m, then you can stop. Uh, so this is a workshop about invariant theory, so I must have an invariant in my talk. And uh, so the invariant of this ellipsoid algorithm is uh, that the, if the optimal point had value at most a, then it continues to be in this ellipsoid. Okay, you must wonder, where am I using convexity? I mean, this, this general argument seems to be able to solve anything, but this is where we use convexity of the function f, okay? And this is easy to check. <coughs> so the first order condition of convexity implies that the value of the function at y star is at least the value at y k plus whatever you get by the gradient approximation at y k, okay? We know because we are only working in the case when the problem is feasible. So if f y star is, if, if uh, the problem is feasible, then f y star is at most a. And you went into this cutting plane because this algorithm told you that f y k is bigger than a. That's why we went there. And hence, this number here cannot be positive. In fact, it must be negative, okay? So the convexity is crucial and this number being negative means that the point y star is not cut out by this, this plane. Yeah? Just uh, because you explained so beautifully how beautiful it is, I think it's more, most people would know, but this is the idea of Katya. That's right. Oh. Yeah, this is, I mean, yeah, this is, a, there is a whole history. So I, I'm sorry I'm not writing down names because then the slides will be full of names and not actually, much content. Actually, it's not exactly true. Uh, the Kachian proved linear programming, yeah. but the method yeah. is in the middle. No, but yes. Yeah, yes. Right. yeah, this is the cutting plane method. That's what he's saying. That's what he's but, saying. Yeah. Yes, but actually, <coughs> they analyzed it, but the guy who introduced it was Naum Shor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Naum Zusinov is Shor. So there are multiple people. There, there is Pat Berg and Rao, there is Karp and Papa Dimitriou, and no, no, there, no, no, no. oh, you're talking about the, the 70s. 70s, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, this is, I think, in my view, uh, uh, the most sophisticated uh, algorithm that we know, and here you see uh, this method. So what about the running time? We are not done yet. We, 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 we saw what the algorithm is, and one can prove by this volume shrinkage lemma, which I mentioned, but I didn't uh, write down, <coughs> that because the volume is shrinking at a good enough rate, the number of iterations, uh, the running time will depend polynomially on the dimension, uh, the time it uh, takes for you to compute a gradient and also to evaluate the function. So I didn't write that, but you can add that to it. And more importantly, the dependence is logarithmic on the bounding ball the value of the function and your error. Three parameters, okay? So there is nothing to stop that this number is really, really big, okay? And then it doesn't turn out to be a polynomial time algorithm. So it is up to us to prove that for this problem, R and M are not too big. That's what remains. But what is great, unlike the gradient and the exponential gradient and all these other methods is that the dependence is logarithmic in one over epsilon, and it requires almost no access to the, to the convex body or the convex function, just very simple. Uh, so in this sense, when people say first order method, this is also a first order method in some sense because it's only asking for a gradient uh, access, right? Okay. So let me, let me spend the, I'm, I know I'm a little bit over time, but I want to speak one slide about the, the, the bit complexity or bounding R and M. So how can we bound R and M? Okay, so 
so if you look at this optimization problem, so this has not changed, this is the same problem. Uh, there is a very natural polytope that you can associate with this polynomial, which is called the Newton polytope. And you can think of each, <coughs> each monomial being a vertex, so where you just write down the indicator vector of the monomial, whether a particular variable is present or not present, and look at the convex hull of these monomials. And you can think of this as the Newton, this is called the Newton polytope of this, uh, of this polynomial. Uh, it turns out that there is a dual to this problem which has an interpretation in terms of entropy, okay? And that's the following. So this problem exactly corresponds to the following optimization problem, which says that, so this point theta, so far I had been very quiet about it, suddenly emerges, and it, the problem is the following, that you're given this point theta. In fact, theta is the center of attention for this problem. It's, you want to express theta as a convex combination of the vertices of this polytope but in a manner which maximizes the entropy of this convex combination. So if Q is the probability distribution over F that you are searching over, what you would like is that the marginals of this, uh, uh, of the, uh, of this probability distribution exactly equal to theta, and then it maximizes <coughs> the relative entropy or the KL divergence between these two distributions. They're not really distributions, but you can think of them as distributions. I mean, they're positive numbers, so. So this, uh, this fact that these two things are the same suddenly gives us a lot of information. So for instance, it is now completely trivial to show that the value of the function can no longer be more than M because this is an entropy of something and we know from very basic information theory that the entropy over a set of size which is at most two to the m cannot be more than m, okay? So, so we get immediately this bound. Uh, the, what we still need to bound is that as this point theta is changing, how does the value of r change? And this is a problem actually. This is not a trivial thing. And the reason is that as this point theta moves close to the boundary, necessarily y star has to go to infinity. And the reason is that if the theta actually lies on some boundary, then you can have no mass on any of these vertices which are not on this plane. And as a consequence, because the probability is given by e to that number, uh, y star, so that y star must be infinity. So as, at the boundary, the value is infinity uh, of y star. So it has to do with how the point behaves uh, in this polytope. So it's some combination of the geometry of the polytope and the point which emerges. And this, is, this, is, this was not easy to understand. And in a couple of works, we, we finally, I think, settled the problem. Uh, <coughs> uh, and here is a very general theorem, <coughs> which also has a somewhat converse that if you have a polytope which has this property, it may have as many facets as you like, but each facet has this property that the numbers that you're using in the description, by scaling you can assume they're integers, it doesn't change anything, but the numbers are all polynomial in the dimension of the polytope. And if you look at any polytope that, in, you know, you can pick up the three volumes of Shriver and start going through spanning tree, matching. So you will not find a counter example to this assumption uh, here. Except that you can still construct examples, some extremal examples, and you can find it in this paper where this condition doesn't hold. So it is not a given. So the point is the following, that it is not a given that you expect the bit complexity to be small. I can construct polytope where this number will blow up. And in fact, faster than an exponential, which will make you impossible to at least find an algorithm in this manner. Okay, so, so the punchline of this uh, <coughs> part of the talk 
was that an entropy interpretation is not only an aesthetic thing, it is also a useful thing, and there is a very quantitative way in which we use this fact to get the bit complexity bound. And I guess you can imagine what, uh, what my comment would be about the brass camp leap, and this is a problem which was already uh, mentioned in the previous talk, that to find an entropy interpretation of the brass camp leap optimization problem might give us some insight as to uh, what is the quantity whose bit complexity we have to bound. And uh, well, I guess brass camp leap comes with its own polyhedron. It's called the brass camp leap polyhedron. So that's good. <coughs> but we don't know what function to optimize over this polytope, which gives us, uh, which gives us exactly the same optimization problem. So that I will leave as an open question and just uh, end my talk. Um, so I guess the, the, the message of uh, this talk is that sometimes non-convexity can be handled if you're just willing to redefine what it means to be a straight line. And geodesics are not new objects. In fact, they go back hundred, hundreds of years in mathematics and physics. You know, uh, they're crucial to the theory of relativity and there's a huge amount of rich structure and understanding about them. But from a computational point of view, working with geodesics is a somewhat non-trivial task. Because now, even quantities like volumes on manifolds become related to uh, curvatures and you know, the Ricci curvature and so on, which are where we don't have such close form analytic bounds necessarily. So, but these are the things to explore. Maybe in special cases, uh, we can handle these objects. <coughs> so these are uh, the two open problems that I already mentioned. I guess uh, this is, I think this is just uh, the beginning to understand uh, geodesic convexity and there are some great applications waiting. And so thanks to Avi for uh, inviting uh, me to give a talk on this. And uh, I guess for all the uh, algorithms people, which are countably many in this dense set, uh, uh, you know, developing algorithms for geodesic convex optimization seems like the way to go forward. And another question uh, which I would like to raise here is optimization goes hand in hand with another problem called sampling. And here uh, you can also ask the problem how to sample from pr probability distributions which are geodesically convex. Okay, so I'll end here. Sorry for going a bit over time. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention and you know, any questions.